Hello, knowledge seekers. In this episode of 20 Minute Books, we delve into the intricate and often secretive world of diplomatic relations between two nations seemingly locked in an endless standoff. Back Channel to Cuba sheds light on the tumultuous history between the United States and Cuba, offering a narrative fortified by newly accessible, declassified documents. For over half a century, these two countries have navigated a complex political dance, marred by public discord and clandestine negotiations. From the Eisenhower era, right through to modern-day presidencies, we explore the untold stories of back-channel efforts to bridge a divide that has defined the geopolitical landscape of the Americas. The book brings into focus the bewildering array of back-channel talks, initiatives, and encounters that sought to remedy a relationship characterized by conflict and missed opportunities. Authors William M. Leo Grande and Peter Kornblu provide unparalleled expertise in these sovereign affairs. Leo Grande, a seasoned professor, brings the academic rigor of his previous works and a comprehensive understanding of Central American politics. Kornblu, in his capacity as the director of the National Security Archive's Cuba Documentation Project, imbues the narrative with an unrivaled wealth of knowledge and historical documentation. Their collaboration yields a book that is both authoritative and immensely readable. Back Channel to Cuba is essential reading for a diverse array of readers. From history enthusiasts eager to understand one of the United States' longest standing conflicts, to political scientists and policymakers interested in the intricate art of diplomacy, it also proves an invaluable resource for aspiring diplomats who seek to learn from the past to better navigate the complex waters of international relations. Join us as we uncover the hidden dialogues that shaped and continue to shape the course of history between these neighboring nations. Back Channel to Cuba, the hidden history of negotiations between Washington and Havana. Introduction. Exploring the dynamics of a contentious neighborhood. Imagine living next door to someone with opposing values and a host of mutual grievances. Now, scale that up to a national level, and you'll grasp the complex and often strained relationship between the United States and Cuba, separated by a mere 90 miles of ocean. Over half a century, This bilateral relationship has fluctuated between frosty silence and eruptive tensions, yet despite the public disputes, a constant thread of communication has wound its way through successive regimes. At times, this dialogue took shape through formal presidential conversations. At others, it snaked through less visible channels, away from the glare of media or public scrutiny. It's a tale of political chess, where every move is calculated and the game is long. Now, Let's delve into the storied past of this international relationship and see how both nations have navigated the turbulent waters of diplomacy. Kennedy's Hidden Hand in Diplomacy with Cuba When discussing covert diplomacy, one cannot simply walk by without acknowledging the efforts of President John F. Kennedy. Amidst a global atmosphere brimming with Cold War tensions, Kennedy had an ace up his sleeve, a skilled negotiator who operated in the shadows sustaining a precarious balance between open hostility and possible reconciliation with Cuba. Through this unnamed emissary, messages were passed and vital lines of communication were kept open, forming an essential, though largely invisible, bridge between the two administrations. The Freedom Flotilla's impact on U.S. Carter ties. Shifting tides come with new administrations, and President Jimmy Carter's term was no exception. During his presidency, an event known as the Freedom Flotilla unfolded, carrying with it profound implications for U.S.-Cuban relations. This massive exodus of Cubans seeking refuge in the United States presented not just a humanitarian crisis, but a political quagmire that further complicated the already delicate negotiations between the neighboring nations, Clinton, Castro, and the sway of the Sunshine State. Fast forward to the 1990s 
and the shadows of electoral politics cast a long reach into the arena of international diplomacy. President Bill Clinton found his Cuba policy intricately tied to the influence of Florida, a state with a sizable Cuban-American population and significant political clout. Balancing the scales of domestic interests and foreign policy became a central challenge of Clinton's presidency, with the ever-present question of how to navigate the unpredictable waters of U.S.-Cuban relations without capsizing his own political ship. Throughout these narratives, a recurring theme emerges. The notion that, despite adversity and antagonism, there have always been channels, formal and otherwise, keeping the conversation between the United States and Cuba alive, if not always well. It's a story of resilience, intrigue, and the relentless pursuit of mutual interests, often cloaked in the shadows of back-channel diplomacy. Part 1. The Revolutionary Spark That Ignited a Complex Saga To navigate the maze of U.S.-Cuban relations, one must step back to a pivotal moment in history, the dawning of 1959. This was the year when the Cuban landscape forever changed, as Fidel Castro, flanked by the legendary Che Guevara, ushered in a new era, sending the dictator Fulgencio Batista into the annals of the past. Castro's ascension marked the beginning of an unpredictable chapter, leaving the United States uncertain and poised for concern. Despite Batista's flawed governance, marked by violence and corruption, he was once an American endeavor, placed into power with U.S. backing. His regime had entwined itself with U.S. financial interests, making his exit a harbinger of unpredictability for American stakes on the island. And so, while Cubans hailed the dawn of Castro's reign, the U.S. watched with a wary gaze, pondering the intentions of this bold new leader. Initially, both Castro and the United States showed an inclination toward establishing cordial relations. Castro set out on a goodwill tour across America, and although the United States was prepared to render financial aid to Castro's new government, the Cuban revolutionary took a different stance. He spurned the opportunity to request funds, fixated on carving out an autonomous Cuba, free from the leashes of American agendas. The fissures in this fragile relationship began to show when President Dwight D. Eisenhower opted for the Gulf Greens over a meeting with Castro a move that left the Cuban leader feeling slighted and undervalued. Upon Castro's return to Cuban soil, things took a decisive turn. His government initiated bold socialist reforms, including the nationalization of large estates, a move that jolted American investors deeply entrenched in Cuba's agricultural domain. In a further shift, Castro purged his government of moderates, elevating more radical and pro-communist figures into the echelons of power. As Cuba drifted, so too did the patience of the United States. By November 1959, the CIA began crafting its covert strategies, seeking to dismantle the edifice of Castro's government from beneath. The scene was set for a clandestine conflict, one that would shape U.S.-Cuban relations for decades to come. Part 2. From Bad to Worse the crumbling of diplomatic possibilities. As Castro's revolutionary government began steering the Cuban ship, the waters with the United States grew increasingly choppy. Even as Ambassador Philip W. Bonsall urged patience from Eisenhower's administration, Castro's alignment with the Soviet Union threw a $100 million wrench into any hopes for smooth sailing. Matters intensified when Cuba and the USSR sealed a trade agreement that promised to be a source of contention for years. Despite Bonsall's pleas, the relationship teetered perilously close to the edge. The breaking point came on a seemingly ordinary day, March 4, 1960, when La Coubre, a Belgian freighter, erupted into flames while docked in Havana, claiming lives and fueling suspicion. Castro's finger pointed squarely at the CIA, setting off a series of accusations and denials that pulled the two nations further apart. In the shadow of this incident, Eisenhower authorized a plan bent on the downfall of Castro, directly contradicting Bonsall's insights on the Cuban leader's popularity. 
The United States' strategies tightened like a noose around Cuba's economy. They started with a sharp cut in sugar purchases, driving Castro to retaliate by nationalizing U.S. assets. In turn, Eisenhower axed the majority of exports heading towards the island nation. Russia, ever the opportunist, stepped into the breach, striking a deal for the now untouchable Cuban sugar. The image of Khrushchev and Castro embracing at a United Nations gathering served as a symbolic affront to the United States, further entrenching their ideological divide. Ultimately, as the Eisenhower era waned, so did the light of diplomacy. On January 4, 1961, the American flag at the U.S. Embassy in Havana was lowered, marking the end of formal diplomatic talks and sealing an era of estrangement between once closely bound neighbors. Part 3. Kennedy juggles covert action with clandestine dialogue. Joining the annals of American presidents faced with the Cuban conundrum, John F. Kennedy entered the White House during a time when Cuba not only declared its sovereignty, but also demonstrated vigor in its self-sustenance. Against the backdrop of the Cold War, the United States' determination to oust Castro persisted, exacerbated by the loss of previous investments in Cuba that topped any other Latin American country. The pieces were thus set for an audacious move, the Bay of Pigs invasion, sanctioned by Kennedy on April 17, 1961. The operation deployed 1,500 CIA-trained Cuban exiles in a botched attempt to dethrone Castro. The failure was swift and resounding. Castro's forces captured the significant majority of the invaders, leaving Kennedy facing a profound defeat and the cold glares from the world stage. In the wake of this blunder, Kennedy declared an all-out economic blockade on Cuba. Yet beneath the surface of this overt aggression, he sought a nuanced approach to the island nation. With Robert Kennedy's involvement, Operation Mongoose emerged, aiming to destabilize and incite insurrection within Castro's domain. Even assassination schemes, including toxicating the leader's cigars, were tabled. Amidst these Machiavellian plots, Kennedy still harbored hopes for a diplomatic throughway, a secret rapprochement track to potentially pivot Castro away from the Soviet Union's embrace. An olive branch appeared from an unexpected figure, Che Guevara. At the Alliance for Progress in Uruguay, Guevara crossed paths with American aide Richard Goodwin. The revolutionary handed Goodwin a box of Cuban cigars for Kennedy, more than a gift. It was a symbol of openness toward reigniting discussions, a gesture signaling Cuba's readiness for a dialogue of normalization. This act laid the foundation for tentative, if cautious, conversations that suggested an interest in peaceful resolution, despite the turbulent operations in play. Part 4. The Dance Between Crisis and Negotiation The shadow of the Bay of Pigs lingered over the United States leaving the difficult task of retrieving 1,200 prisoners captured during the ill-fated invasion. Enter James B. Donovan, a seasoned negotiator with a precedent of successful exchanges under his belt, tasked by Robert Kennedy with a sensitive and vital mission. Landing in Cuba in late August 1962, Donovan carried with him the weight of American expectations, seeking to whittle down Castro's hefty demands. Their initial dialogues bore fruit as Donovan managed to trade financial demands for humanitarian aid. Yet beneath a veneer of progress, trust was scarce, and the specter of Cold War machinations loomed large. Then the world held its breath. Amidst these delicate talks, the discovery of Soviet missiles on Cuban soil by an American spy plane catalyzed an urgent halt to negotiations. October the 14th witnessed Kennedy imposing a naval blockade, marking the onset of the tense Cuban Missile Crisis. Despite the international standstill, a covert lifeline weaved through Brazilian intermediaries kept the back-channel communication afloat. Kennedy laid out a roadmap for Cuba to rekindle amicable relations with Washington, sever the ties with Moscow. While Castro lingered on this proposal, Soviet Premier Khrushchev's decision to withdraw the missiles 
without consulting Castro, piqued the Cuban leader's interest in resuming the disrupted dialogue. Reinvigorated by Khrushchev's surprising move and feeling slighted by the sidelining, Castro signaled his readiness to Donovan, leading to a renewed round of negotiations. By December 21st, signatures adorned a memo that secured the prisoner's release. In exchange, $2.9 million cash alongside a substantial provision of medicine and food valued at $53 million. The critical door to compromise remained open, albeit slightly ajar, as both nations navigated the uneasy path between confrontation and conciliation. Part 5. Unlikely Friendships and the Art of Diplomatic Finesse In the wake of the prisoner exchange following the ill-starred Bay of Pigs invasion, an uncanny rapport blossomed between James Donovan and Fidel Castro. Their burgeoning friendship sowed seeds for continued discourse and the optimistic possibility of advancing bilateral relations. The calendar flipped to 1963, and the Donovan-Castro talks progressed, focusing on the release of U.S. citizens detained amidst Cuba's revolutionary convulsions. January witnessed a delicate exchange, freeing these individuals in return for Cubans held in U.S. confines. Come April, Donovan's diplomatic dance persisted, this time alongside a personal twist bringing his son into the Cuban milieu to join Castro for a bout of fishing and a baseball game, epitomizing cultural diplomacy. Yet, an elephant in the room loomed over their camaraderie, Washington's insistence that Cuba cut Soviet ties to normalize relations. Despite the formidable roadblock, Castro displayed a willingness to persist, though the way forward was as clear as a fog-enshrouded path. Donovan, ever the master of easing tensions, offered a humorous analogy on proceeding with caution akin to a delicate courtship between porcupines. Donovan's successive visit introduced a new player, Lisa Howard, an ambitious journalist who charmed Castro and procured an invitation to feature him on her TV program. Through her reportage, aired on May 10, 1963, she captivated the American public prompting the New York Times to capture the moment's essence, a shared longing for peaceful resolution. Howard's diplomatic exploits caught the White House's attention, resulting in an unprecedented move. They vested her with an unofficial back-channel role to Cuba. The plan saw Howard broaching the prospect of a meeting between Castro and her confidant, William Atwood, a respected media figure and counselor to UN Ambassador Adlai Stevenson. Lisa Howard's foray into the tangled web of U.S.-Cuban dialogues stood as proof that sometimes the most delicate threads of communication are spun outside the rigid confines of formal diplomacy. Part 6. The Abrupt Halt An Assassination's Impact on Diplomacy As the tide seemed to be turning, and diplomatic channels fluttered with possibility, President John F. Kennedy engaged Jean Daniel, a French journalist, as his envoy imparting an optimistic message to Fidel Castro. This beacon of hope was tragically extinguished as word of Kennedy's assassination reached Castro during his conversation with Daniel on November 22, 1963. Castro's immediate fear was that blame would fall upon Cuba, casting a dark shadow over any potential for détente. The assassination not only shook the world, but also fractured the fragile fabric of U.S.-Cuban dialogue. In tandem, Lisa Howard's back-channel endeavors were disrupted amidst the tumultuous transition of power. Precisely when tangible progress seemed imminent, the response outlining a vital meeting's agenda was swallowed by the chaos following Kennedy's death. Lyndon B. Johnson, now at the helm, faced pressure to assert a firm stance against communism. His administration flirted with increasingly belligerent policies toward Cuba, undermining the conciliatory efforts of his predecessor. The situation further soured as evidence emerged of Cuban support for revolutions in Brazil and Venezuela. Johnson perceived this as a glaring betrayal of any talks of warming relations, leading the U.S. to further constrict the noose of embargo and travel prohibitions around Cuba's economy. Amidst these tensions, 
Castro's dramatic move to open Camarioca port in September 1965 presented an escape valve for Cubans yearning for American shores, triggering an exodus comprised of thousands. This phenomenon compelled the two nations into an unavoidable public negotiation. A cornerstone initiative was set in motion, the Cuban refugee airlift. This unprecedented operation not only facilitated the flight of more than a quarter million Cubans to the U.S., but also laid down a pathway to citizenship, drawing a tangible link between the divided nations. Daily flights from Cuba persisted under the airlift's ambit until 1973, a testament to how crisis can sometimes force the hand of diplomacy, establishing avenues for humanitarian relief amid the relentless geopolitical tempest. Part 7. Nixon's Refusal and Kissinger's Clandestine Overture Fidel Castro found little respite as the presidential baton passed from Lyndon Johnson to Richard Nixon. With Nixon at the helm from 1969, the U.S.'s stance towards Cuba solidified into an impenetrable barrier. Nixon had no qualms expressing his extreme aversion to Castro, promising his administration that U.S. policy towards Cuba would stand firm and unyielding during his term. One might have expected some level of collaboration when a spate of plane hijackings, numbering a staggering 325 between 1968 and 1972, raised red flags. Castro's sympathizers from the United States and beyond commandeered planes to Cuba, seeking asylum. But the New Island arrivals were not wholly welcome. Despite the hijack crisis, of which an alarming dozen occurred in the early months of 1969, Nixon withheld cooperation. Cuba was prepared to prosecute and even extradite hijackers to nations with established terms. Yet Nixon's administration stayed its rigid course, eschewing negotiations. Meanwhile, Henry Kissinger, Nixon's Secretary of State, struggled to square this non-negotiating policy with the broader geopolitical shifts. Nixon courted success with communist China, and public opinion at home wavered, with only a third of Americans reportedly against normalizing relations with Cuba. By 1973, the winds of change swept through Latin America, as nations like Chile, Peru, and Argentina recalibrated their stance towards Cuba, signaling a recognition that sanctions and subversion held little sway over Castro. It was amidst this reality, and as the Watergate scandal consumed Nixon's attention, that Kissinger seized the moment. In a bold, surreptitious move in 1974, he dispatched political adviser Frank Mankiewicz to parlay a message to Castro. Kissinger's gambit opened the door for hushed back-channel discussions, a glimmer of hope for a relationship mired in decades of distrust. Part 8 navigating diplomatic deadlock during Ford's tenure. In the aftermath of the Watergate scandal that saw Nixon resign, Gerald Ford ascended to the presidency, inheriting the complex landscape of U.S.-Cuban relations. Henry Kissinger, maintaining his role as Secretary of State under Ford, continued to covertly weave diplomatic threads with Cuba through the mid-1970s. Kissinger went as far as to sanction U.S. travel visas for Cuban delegates, opening a channel for the first direct conversations in years. Yet, behind closed doors, the discussions hit an immovable obstacle. Cuba, represented by Foreign Minister Pellegrin Torres, stood firm, demanding the U.S. lift its blockade as a precondition for serious negotiations. Conversely, The U.S. government pushed Cuba to reduce its revolutionary activities in Latin America and distance itself from the Soviet Union before they could entertain the idea of easing the blockade. The diplomatic stalemate deepened in 1975 when Castro dispatched Cuban troops to Angola's civil war. The conflict, already a proxy battleground for global powers, now featured Cuban forces backing the Soviet supported MPLA against the UNITA faction, which had clandestine U.S. backing. This move by Castro drew Ford's ire, prompting a cessation of all formal negotiations. Nonetheless, Kissinger, the seasoned diplomat, labored to keep back-channel talks afloat in 1976 despite widening cracks, 
Complications escalated as Cuban exiles in the U.S. aggressively targeted Cuban embassies worldwide and orchestrated a devastating airline bombing on October 6, 1976, claiming 73 innocent lives. The rumored involvement of an ex-CIA agent in this act caused Castro to press the U.S. for reprisal against the attackers. With the echoes of the tragedy reverberating, the gulf between the two nations widened, and Castro's insistence on punitive measures against the responsible Cuban exiles underscored another grim reality. Substantial progress would remain elusive as long as retribution and accusations clouded the path toward reconciliation. Part 9. Carter's Aspirations and the Exodus that Rocked His Presidency As President Jimmy Carter entered the White House in 1977, he brought with him fresh perspectives on the long-standing standoff with Cuba. Amidst the shadows of Cuban exiles and the thorny issue of Angola, Carter sought transformative diplomacy. He posited that trade and commerce could serve as key instruments in reshaping communist regimes. Curtailing spy plane surveillance, Carter established an interest section in Havana, a quasi-diplomatic endeavor devoid of full embassy honors but still significant. Ingresses of progress materialized. Castro recognized dual citizenship and exhibited goodwill by releasing American detainees. However, the dialogue staggered into familiar territory, with the U.S. insistent on Cuba's realignment of its foreign policy as a stipulation for discussing the blockade's dismantlement. Cuba, remaining steadfast, bristled at the prospect of shaping its international posture to appease U.S. demands. Then, Carter's administration found itself ensnared in another Cuban quandary as the decade drew to a close. A distressing economic downturn, exacerbated by agricultural plagues, compelled desperate Cubans towards perilous and sometimes violent escapes by seizing boats. The U.S. stance, however, remained unchanged continuing to grant asylum to Cuban refugees in a deliberate strategy to erode Castro's hold on power. Warnings from Castro about the ramifications of the U.S.'s lenient treatment of the desperate and, at times, criminal exiles were disregarded. In a seismic reaction, Castro flung open the gates of Mariel Harbor in April 1980. A swelling armada of boats breasted the waves towards Florida, ferrying nearly 80,000 Cubans to American soil. The media swiftly christened this exodus the Freedom Flotilla. The overwhelming migration not only taxed American resources, but dealt a severe political blow to Carter, casting shadows over his bid for re-election. A costly political maelstrom spun from a mix of humanitarian crises and unwavering stances on both sides of the Florida Straits. Part 10. Reagan's Stance and subsequent coercive diplomacy. The political climate in Washington shifted markedly with Ronald Reagan's victory in the 1980 presidential election. Reagan's strategy for Cuba was unyieldingly hawkish. Sharper embargoes, intensified sanctions, and the looming possibility of military action painted a foreboding picture. Sensing the tension, Castro moved to de-escalate, halting the support previously funneled to guerrillas in Nicaragua and El Salvador. Despite Reagan's aggressive stance, practical issues compelled his administration to engage with the Castro government. One such dilemma revolved around the excludables, Cuban migrants with criminal backgrounds who had arrived on American shores without a framework for their potential return to Cuba. By 1984, pragmatism trumped rigid policies, pushing the U.S. into formal discussions over the excludables. An accord was struck on December 13th, with Cuba agreeing to repatriate the 2,746 individuals, while in turn, the U.S. would allocate an annual immigration quota for 20,000 Cubans. The pragmatism of these negotiations could have been a springboard for broader dialogue, but further discussions remained elusive. Instead, Hostility rippled through the relationship with the inauguration of Radio Marti by the United States on Cuba's Independence Day in 1985, a brazen act aimed to ferment internal dissent against Castro. Through Reagan's tenure to the presidency of George H.W. Bush, 
The international atmosphere evolved as the Cold War's frost began to thaw. Bush's administration, eyeing the unraveling of communist regimes come 1991, postured for patience. Conversations with Russian leaders, Gorbachev and Yeltsin, substantiated the conclusion that Soviet military support to Cuba was on borrowed time, with a definite end scheduled in January 1992. To the Bush White House, containment and patience seemed a viable strategy. The Cuban question, they surmised, would resolve itself in due course. Part 11. Clinton's Political Tightrope Walk with Cuba The 1990s painted an intricate political landscape where the state of Florida, with its significant Cuban-American contingent, emerged as a decisive factor in presidential races. As candidate Bill Clinton keenly understood this dynamic, he pledged a hardline stance on Cuba to garner support. Upon taking office in 1993, Clinton ratified his commitment by signing the Cuban Democracy Act at the behest of Floridian anti-Castro lobbyists. Aimed at intensifying the blockade and fomenting domestic opposition to Castro, the act mirrored Clinton's campaign promises. While publicly maintaining this firm front, Clinton's team sought wiggle room to subtly cultivate amicable relations with Cuba without provoking the ire of his Cuban-American voter base. Through calculated measures that aligned with the act's framework, they eased travel restrictions and allowed Cuban intellectuals and artists to visit the United States. Yet, the perennial issue of Cuban migration soon demanded attention. In 1993, a tide of Cubans undertook perilous journeys on makeshift rafts, balsas, sparking the Balsero crisis. The unprecedented surge reached its zenith one August day in 1994, as the U.S. Coast Guard rescued over 3,000 individuals from the treacherous sea. Addressing this human exodus necessitated diplomatic finesse. Enter Gabriel Garcia Marquez, a Nobel laureate and friend to Castro, tasked with mediating over a Clinton-hosted dinner. Castro's message centered on the imperative for bilateral talks, not just on migration, but also to address the broader narrative of the embargo and path to improved relations. Clinton, seeing a dual opportunity to humanize the crisis and secure political longevity, signaled a conditional willingness to engage on broader issues if Castro curtailed the immigrant outflow, a move that could stabilize Clinton's standing for a prospective second term. This exchange exemplified a nuanced dance of diplomacy, played out on a stage where presidential politics and international crises intertwined. Part 12. Clinton's Final Strides Toward Reconciliation with Cuba As the U.S. elections in 1994 approached, a significant shift occurred. The waters calmed, and the Coast Guard encountered zero migrants from Cuba thanks to Castro's compliance with the previous agreement with President Clinton. Yet, as Clinton embarked on his second term, the waters of political dissent roiled again. Tensions spike with the actions of Brothers to the Rescue, BTTR, an anti-Castro group based in Miami known for their aerial incursions, disseminating propaganda over Cuban airspace. Castro's patient appeals to the U.S. to halt these illegal flights were met with inaction prompting a drastic and fatal response from the Cuban military as it shot down two BTTR planes in January 1996, resulting in the loss of four lives. This tragic incident propelled the adoption of the Helms-Burton Bill, essentially locking the sanctions against Cuba into congressional control and stripping the president of significant power to amend the prevailing embargo policy. Ambitions for repairing U.S.-Cuban relations during Clinton's presidency grew dim. In an unexpected twist, Thanksgiving Day of 1999 presented an unforeseen diplomatic juncture, the case of Elian Gonzalez. The five-year-old Cuban boy, who survived a harrowing crossing only to lose his mother to the sea, became the focus of an international custody battle. While residing with his Miami uncle, it was revealed that Elian's father, residing in Cuba, longed for his son's return. The debate engulfed communities, 
politicians, and nations. Cuban Americans rallied for Elian's permanence in the U.S., whilst the Cuban and U.S. governments agreed on the boy's repatriation. Ultimately, the U.S. Supreme Court echoed the latter sentiment, and Elian Gonzalez rejoined his father in Cuba. The conclusion of this emotionally charged saga sparked Cuban-American protests and resonated throughout the political fabric, contributing to the electoral defeat of Al Gore in Florida during the 2000 presidential campaign, sealing George W. Bush's path to the presidency. Clinton's tenure concluded with this diplomatic note, an incident emblematic of the intricate human elements that weave through the fabric of international relations. Part 13. Shifting Policies Under George W. Bush and Barack Obama Following the electoral footsteps of his father, President George W. Bush approached Cuban relations with an unwavering stance, steering clear of any negotiation efforts. Bush commemorated Cuban Independence Day in 2002 with the unveiling of the Initiative for a New Cuba, a policy crafted with the hopes of spurring a shift towards democracy in Cuba. Castro's retort to this ambition was swift and mass-supported. He orchestrated a national petition that garnered the signatures of 8 million Cubans, a resounding defense of their socialistic identity. Bush persisted, announcing in October 2003 the Commission for Assistance to a Free Cuba. This move not only reaffirmed restrictive travel stipulations, but also doubled down on efforts to destabilize Castro's regime. As Fidel Castro's health waned in 2006, an eventual transfer of power to his brother Raul coincided with the rise of Barack Obama on the U.S. political horizon. Obama's campaign rhetoric diverged significantly from his predecessors, pledging an end to the long-standing, restrictive approach towards Cuba. His vision for a fresh diplomatic era echoed even in the Cuban exile enclave of Little Havana, where he advocated for change in U.S.-Cuban policy. This message, unexpected perhaps in its locale, helped secure Florida for Obama in the 2008 presidential election. In power, Obama's administration tentatively explored new avenues for engagement. His deputy assistant secretary of state, Bisa Williams, returned from a Cuban visit in 2009 with optimistic overtures for a rebooted bilateral dialogue. Obama acting on his pledge, reopened cultural doorways, facilitating educational and artistic exchange, and strengthened telecommunications between the nations. This outreach, while fostering connectivity, would unveil complexities and emerging issues in the new chapter of U.S.-Cuba relations. Part 14. A slow start accelerates into renewed hope. At the onset of Barack Obama's presidency, a wave of optimism swept through regarding an anticipated shift in the U.S. approach towards Cuba. Despite such optimism, the early days were marred by challenges and controversies. Embedded in Obama's plans to enhance Cuba's telecommunications was the less publicized agenda of cyber operations aimed at undermining Cuba's status quo. Funds earmarked for democracy promotion went towards bolstering anti-government bloggers and deploying Alan Gross on a clandestine mission to construct a network to empower dissidents. Gross's capture and subsequent sentencing to a 15-year prison term quashed any illusion of a smooth transition in policy. Visits by influential figures like Jimmy Carter and Bill Richardson were unable to thaw the deep freeze. Gross's situation had exacerbated, yet, as Obama's second term dawned, promising indicators began to surface. John Kerry and Chuck Hagel, secretaries of state and defense respectively, openly pledged a recalibration of U.S. policy towards Cuba. 2012 witnessed Obama's administration approving Rene Gonzalez's release, a fraction of the Cuban Five. Intelligence officers embroiled in a 1998 Miami conspiracy. Renewed postal exchanges and dialogue on migration issues further signaled a shift. In a reciprocal move, Cuba consented to medical access for Gross, softening their previous steadfastness. However, it was in December 2013 when a small but profound moment of change was broadcast to the world. As world leaders gathered to honor Nelson Mandela, Raul Castro and Barack Obama shared a handshake that rippled beyond the simplicity of the gesture. 
This public acknowledgement of mutual recognition, given the clandestine nature of the past half-century's communications between U.S. presidents and Cuban leaders, held substantive significance, an emblematic nod to a potentially transformative era in U.S.-Cuban relations. Final summary. Navigating through the turbulent waters of U.S.-Cuban relations, we understand that the reality of international diplomacy is often a tangle of pride, principles, and the pursuit of power. Over half a century, both nations grappled with their ideological differences, neither willing to offer concessions that might be construed as a weakness or acceptance of adversarial terms. Cuba's steadfast hold on its socialist governance and foreign policy clashed with the United States' relentless efforts to enforce change through sanctions and geopolitical pressure. Simultaneously, the U.S.'s determination to maintain a stance of disapproval towards Cuba's actions stifled the potential for openness or amicability. Yet, despite the public impasses and collapse negotiations, a continuous thread of back-channel discussions persisted indicating that beneath the facade of animosity, the aspiration for progress never completely waned. The ongoing secret dialogues between the boundaries of the Cold War and the 21st century revealed a latent acknowledgement by both nations of the benefits that could one day be reaped from restored relations. They signal a quietly enduring hope that reconciliation, however complex and elusive, is a horizon worth steering towards in a sea of political strife. Thank you for joining me today on this journey of learning and discovery as we explored the insights of another thought-provoking book in our growing library of knowledge. If you've enjoyed our time together, please take a moment to follow our podcast give us a five-star rating, and share 20-minute books with other knowledge seekers. Your support truly means a lot. Don't forget to join me again in the next episode, where we will delve into another enriching book. Until then, happy reading and happy listening.